My name is, full name is John Avi Roop. I go by Avi. I'm with the Stanford Biodesign Program and I am a innovation fellow there. I've been in, in, in healthcare medical devices since I was 19 as a co-op at the University of Minnesota in the Mechanical Engineering School. And I am um, now 33. I intend to work in healthcare. Uh, I'm not sure if it's gonna be medical devices, but definitely healthcare for probably the balance of my career. Typical challenges are best um, described by the standard reactions that uh, I hear from investors who, when we talk about the, the topic of pediatric medical device innovation, specifically when they ask me, what are you doing next? I told them about Kaufman and this pediatric in initiative. And the answer is typically, God, that's, that's great. That's a really interesting field. We've looked into it. We'd love to get into it because there's so little competition in the space. But yet, um, how, do you, how are you going to get around the small markets and the fact that the same disease process in a 2-year-old versus a 12-year-old versus an 18-year-old are in basically three different bodies? And uh, how do you get around the fact that there's an incredibly high regulatory and the risk of failure is, is high? So how do, you, how do you balance all that? I think, um, so, so those are the challenges as I see them. And that's a lot of the reason why uh, we think there hasn't been a, an adequate amount of innovation in the space. Uh, I did a presentation here yesterday, and one of the first uh, slides I put up was a, a depiction of a percutaneous aortic uh, valve, which is a technology that has a tremendous amount of investment that also has a unknown uh, reimbursement situation, unknown regulatory path, and a lot of risk. I think the difference is, is it's, in, it's in a market that people are really comfortable with. So what that leads me to believe is that Pediatric medical devices are a market, they're just a failed market, and new thinking is going to be required to, to invigorate that market. What it allows, uh, allows us to focus on is, at a very core level, finding some unmet needs in the pediatric space and, and working to build concepts and business plans uh, that have a chance of being funded around them. And, and funding is, is a broad term, could be philanthropic dollars, could be traditional venture investment. What is more interesting to me and what Kaufman, the Kaufman Foundation is also interested in is the academic comparison of adult innovation versus pediatric innovation. Part of the reason why Kevin and I were selected was we spent last academic year um, pursuing a biodesign process at Stanford that uh, came to the creation of a company called Marette Surgical, which is very new. It has very little money behind it, but is answering an unmet adult uh, need. The process of repeating that in juxtaposition of what we did last year is gonna help us unearth some of the differences. And as we identify the differences and think about the differences, the, the goal is that we will come to some conclusions that are teachable, that will provide um, a more robust or more uh, palatable process for other innovators who want to come in and, and achieve uh, some uh, different, achieve so, some impact in the pediatric medical device space. Yeah, obviously, teamwork is the answer. Um, we can't do it alone. Kevin and I have uh, very different skill sets. Kevin has a basic science background and is a uh, neurosurgery resident. I have an engineering background and I'd moved into marketing in the medical device world. So we bring some complementary skill sets, but neither, neither of us have any experience in uh, pediatric medical devices. So the, the balance of that um, fuel to get to warp speed is coming from Kaufman. Their network has put us in touch with, over the past three months, uh, a, a host of innovators in the pediatric medical device space, and we've been able to really interview them and have conversations about how they've been successful, what were their challenges, um, that interviewing process was our first step at articulating what, where have people been successful, why are they not more successful, and what would be the next step that would take the existing business models and existing approaches and make them uh, better. The next phase will be immersion into the uh, pediatric space. We've selected orthopedics and, and pulmonology. We chose uh, those two areas because we felt we needed a, from our perspective, a lower risk um, area and a higher risk area. And the reason we wanted to balance the two is because lower risk uh, ideas, lower risk needs have, a, from our calculus, a better chance of being solved quickly. And that quick solution is 
personally what we think is necessary to catalyze the market, if you will. Uh, demonstration of success uh, breeds more success. On the other hand, loftier goals uh, have a much clearer mission drive behind them and are much more inspiring to uh, the innovator searching the web looking for a way to make an impact and they come across some things that we've worked on. Um, so the balance of the two is, is why we've selected that uh, and the, the next phase to add fuel to, to get to warp speed is, is really the immersion with the, the customer and the customer is, uh, is a host of people from the all of the caregivers to the, the infrastructure around care delivery and the patients themselves. I think it has multiple opportunities for yielding positive results. On a very traditional uh, end of the spectrum, there's an opportunity to create a business that makes an impact in pediatric healthcare, whatever that may be. And five years out, uh, it's, it would be natural, if that is the path, to have um, an early set of money from probably a, a foundation or, or partnership foundations who are interested in seeing uh, this problem uh, affected. And uh, the creation of a, of a business that's sustainable is one of the goals we're looking for. If you look at standard uh, medical device entrepreneurship that is following the traditional pathway of a venture-backed uh, road that builds a sales force and, and commercializes a product, there's roughly a sub-30% chance of being successful. If we could on the other end of the spectrum, create a process by which other innovators would feel confident that they could, they too could, could engage in an entrepreneurial effort that had roughly a 30% chance of being successful at, at, at achieving sustainability, where they no longer needed philanthropic dollars to maintain uh, their market market presence, uh, would be a huge win for us as well. So that latter part I, I bring to bear because that would be the other way to add value is to create. Uh, a body of thinking or advance the body of thinking around pediatric medical device innovation such that others would have a process by which they could feel confident in, in making a difference. When asked why medical devices are so expensive, w the reason they are so expensive is, is you're paying for, the, the healthcare system is paying for the quality control of those medical devices. Medical devices by and large in themselves are not that expensive to create. What is really expensive to create is to know that when I ship that product out of the factory, it's not going to fail or it's going to fail at a very extremely low rate that we are ethically uh, comfortable with. The other end is, is, is ethical frameworks, and that's something that we ran into, Kevin and I ran into very early on. We've been doing some, uh, some, some consulting work for a pediatric airway management project Point being to kind of get in, jump, jump in headfirst into a, a mid-stage uh, product. And we also had interfaced with some individuals from rare disease foundations. And we ran smack into the question of, if we have to choose between this batch of sick kids and this other batch of sick kids, how do we do that? How, and how does anyone do that? And what we realized is that we needed to spend a lot of time building and, and being able to comment on our own ethical framework that would guide us through those decisions. And that's another piece that we will comment on academically is, is how, do you, how do you individually define what the impact you'd like to make? Um, you know, it starts with a very, very simple question, is, is one life worth more than the next? And, and, some, and there's really two camps. Some people believe that that's too hard to judge. Others do believe they can judge that. And I don't think there's a right or wrong answer as long as you're comfortable with your own thought, your, your own framework that's comfortable, and, and you then operate from that, you can start to make these sorts of decisions. So there, the, it, you know, it comes back to, I'm very process driven as an engineer, obviously. So it, for me, it always comes back to, okay, well, what, what is the way to, you know, what's the way to tap into my, you know, tap my emotions into a process that's gonna give me some thinking that I can come back to? Because that's, for me, when it's, when the practical application of this is when someone asks me that question, well, why, why work on uh, you know, preterm babies versus uh, you know, teenagers that have rare storage disorder, rare brain storage disorder diseases? Um, you know, I'll be able to come back to some, a body of thinking that I've done and be able to work my way to that answer, which is, is something I think everyone needs to do. And that's part of uh, another output that we think is, is really valuable in this, in this space is that if entrepreneurs can do that thinking, they can better align themselves with some of these unmet pediatric needs.